Hello, and welcome to a new Starting Conversations, brought to you by the New Mexico Humanities Council. Starting Conversations is a roundtable discussion series that explores history and culture in New Mexico and beyond. I'm Bethany Tabor, the host, and I'm very thrilled to be sharing this new series with the world, with our audience. Culture Springs from Food will explore the unique relationship between food and culture in New Mexico, bringing together voices including farmers, chefs, local experts, artists, historians, and academics, among others. We are so lucky to be partnering with an organization based in Albuquerque, New Mexico, Three Sisters Kitchen. They are a nonprofit kitchen, cafe, and community space focused on nourishing communities through food, education, and public engagement. Today's episode is examining this phrase or idea, cooking as archiving. What we want to explore in this discussion is how cultures preserve themselves through culinary practices, cooking, rituals, community gatherings, etc. We're also looking at how historians incorporate food into their research and how cooking or food rituals create a living, breathing archive. We have three amazing panelists joining us today, and without further ado, I'll get started. I'll open with a general question addressed to each, and I'll start with Dr. Josie Lopez. Josie has been the curator of art at the Albuquerque Museum since 2018. She was previously a guest curator at the museum where she curated the carved line block printmaking in New Mexico. Currently, she is working on organizing upcoming traveling exhibitions for the museum and exhibitions featuring a broad range of art historical and contemporary themes. Josie oversees the museum's collections and the permanent exhibition, Common Ground, Art in New Mexico. Prior to her curatorial position at the Albuquerque Museum, Josie curated Puerto Rico, Defying Darkness, Currency, What Do You Value, and Species in Peril along the Rio Grande. Josie completed a BA in history and a master's in teaching at Brown University. She completed her PhD at the University of California, Berkeley. Her dissertation explored printmaking in 19th century Mexico, Spain, and France. Josie's research interests include examining art as a discursive agent in the political arena, the intersections of art and the environment, modern and contemporary Latin American art, and the history of Mexican and New Mexican art. As the 2013 to 15 Eleanor Tufts Fellow at SMU, she taught courses on modern Mexico and the Prince of Francisco Goya. She has also taught courses on the history of printmaking and European art at the University of New Mexico. Josie, thank you so much for being here. And I wanna hear your perspective on when you hear this phrase, cooking as archiving, what does it mean to you or what does it make you think of? Well, I think it has, uh, I, first starting with definitions is probably a good place. And when we think about cooking, we often think about the activity of preparing food, for example. But I think as universities, as museums, as academic and educational institutions explore the ideas of how cooking and archiving go together, we start to see that there's a broader universe of the ways in which food, objects, customs, peoples, communities are all part of what makes cooking even possible. And so obviously as a museum, we have some limitations about physically cooking, uh, you know, in the museum or in a gallery space. Um, but we also have at our museum, luckily, um, a wonderful photo archives as well as history collections. So we do have this incredible rich selection of objects that not only tell the stories of, of cooking as a process in itself, but the much broader web of how farming and cultivation and growing cuts across various communities um, over time. And of course, you know, through film and photography, we can capture certain elements, but I have to say the sights and the smells and the tastes, um, you know, are not necessarily apparent in some of that archival material. In terms of archiving, I think there's another also conversation that's happened, especially um, in museums in particular, but also academic institutions of what, what is it that creates an archive and who gets to decide what materials get included into that archive. One of the broader conversations that we've had at our museum is that historically something had to be a hundred years old 
right, for it to be considered history. Um, and we've really shifted that thinking. We've really brought in the way uh, and asking the question in a much different way now where we ask, what are the things, what are the ideas, what are the customs, what are the histories that we need to pre pre be preserving today for tomorrow's generations? And I think that's a different way of thinking about archives that's more inclusive of the diverse communities, certainly in Albuquerque, but across our state and our region. And so those are some of the, the ways in which we think that not only food and cooking, but all of the larger web of what goes into allowing for communities to nourish themselves um, become really important for um, spaces like our museum. Uh, thanks. I um, I really appreciate that uh, that note about what do you need to be preserving today. I think that something that I think about all the time is this. Um, uh, what's happening now is the history of decades from now, and and how do you help researchers in the future? Um, I think that that's really vital when we think about archiving. Um, next, we'll hear from Andy, um, Andy Murphy. Uh, from Dine Ancestry is the creator, host, and producer of the Toasted Sister podcast, a show about indigenous food. She's the senior producer of the Native America Calling radio program, a one-hour national radio show about indigenous issues and topics where she hosts a food-focused show every month called The Menu. She is the 2021-2022 Civil Eats Indigenous Foodways Fellow. Andy, thanks for being here. And I'll pose the same question to you. What does cooking as archiving make you think or mean to you? Well, um, you know, cooking as archiving, um, you know, I'll kind of take it, uh, you know, in a more contemporary space here. Um, but you know, many of our memories are based around flavors and textures and um, dishes and, you know, some of those kind of, um, you know, sensory memories are, um, you know, very, of course, apparent in Native communities, um, because kind of like what, what you said, the you know, cookbooks and history books and, and, you know, documents like that weren't written by native people. Um, there's, there's so many questions I get from other um, academics and journalists about um, native cookbooks and recipes and what are some of these like ancient historic dishes. And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> you know, we pass these things along from generation to generation, from learning from your grandma, from learning from your mom. Um, and, you know, it's just recently that we are documenting a lot of these things. And, you know, with all the, um, you know, forced assimilation that happened in uh, America and the, you know, whole boarding school era where, you know, we were taught, for, forcefully taught a whole different way of cooking and eating. And our traditional foodways were just disrupted and um, in many places severed. Um, you know, so there's, there's this relying on that, uh, uh, those flavors, once you come across it, um, you know, it could be randomly just at uh, a fair or a restaurant or your friend's house. And, and that just the flavor or the smell just like triggers you to remember what, uh, you know, grandma used to cook before she died or, um, oh, I remember that's how my mom used to make it. So, you know, the, there's that kind of um, archiving that's happening just actively right now. Um, and I think that's, uh, you know, some of the things I don't, I think uh, many people don't understand about Native American food is that there are um, just lots of changes and lots of um, individual connections to food. I mean, it's just very hard to put like blanket statements on Native American food and dishes because it's so individual. I mean, the, the archive is like here on my table uh, right now. 
connected to you know stories and memories within uh, each of our families. So, um, you know, on another um, on another plane, you know. Um, one of the things in journalism they always say is that, you know, newspapers like the first draft of history, um, you know, I kind of consider myself, uh, um, you know, a, a person contributing to some of those first drafts of Native American, um, you know, <laughs> food history right now by just putting all of these voices and dishes and, you um, uh you know flavors um into podcast form into written form so that uh uh people could could learn from um learn from uh our food and in turn learn about our culture and about our people i love when you said that your archive is on your kitchen table at the moment because that also it speaks to this um this idea that we have the dominant idea of an archive, we think that it has to be something that is in a museum or written, documented in written form in a book. And when history is made and preserved through um, changes through individual families and, and um, uh, people meeting one another and different um, cross pollinations happening, things like that. Um, and so it even challenges the notion of what an archive should be or how to how to define it. Um, yeah, so I appreciate definitely. that. <laughs> no, there's a lot of there's a lot of movements right now in Native America to take um, to take uh, back ownership of all of this knowledge, um, because like you said, the there was a privilege of who got to write the history and who gets attributed when um, talking about any kind of subject, you know, it was mostly white men. And, um, you know, right now we're still in this thinking that it's not fact unless it's written down and right. who wrote it down some some old white man who died a long time ago <laughs> who stole it from people of color mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um thank you for the thank you uh and i'll finally move on to our third guest dr eric romero eric is the interim chair of the department of languages and culture at new mexico highlands university the vice chair of the diversity equity and inclusion advisory council Senior Associate at the Center for the Study and Education of Diverse Populations, and the Interim Director of the Center for the Study of Northern New Mexico and the Greater Southwest. His research interests include Chicano ethnic identity formation, Southwestern sociolinguistics, heritage language revitalization, Hispanic land grant and acequia communities, immigration, US-Mexico border relations, Becas para Azatlan program history, placemaking and rural land use behaviors and Native American and Mezistaje traditions. And to you, Eric, same question. What, what does cooking as archiving mean to you or make you think of? I, I, I like the direction of where this conversation has already started with some, some foundational ideas. Uh, one, you know, the idea of definitions, you know, both, both the idea of cooking and the idea of archiving and, and, and cooking, you know, it, it, Cooking is an aspect of food culture. You know, we, I, I think we're we're invested and we're representative of discussions that that uh, that recognize the larger the, the the larger conversation at hand around food culture and food tradi food traditions and such. But archival, when I, when I first looked at the word again, I I myself being an academician, I kind of lent toward the idea of a, again of an institutionalized structured academic presentation representation of you know what what do we do with knowledge what do we do with culture and so that's deeply affiliated with well what are the institutions where's the housing for that archival process whether it be a library whether it be a museum whether it be a again a local cooking school and such so I, th I think we, it's within our interest to amplify that idea of archival and saying it's recording, it's sharing, it's creating that larger sense of community and such. And, and what do we use an archive for? You know, one, it's not just for posterity that we want to capture folkloric knowledge and it has to be 80, 900, 120, 200 years old before it has a recognized value to be inserted within a, some kind of archival process. Um, I, I'm really appreciative that a lot of the museums and, 
and institutions of higher education are looking at the archival process as an invitation to dialogue in a, in a conversation rather than just a, a uh, like I say, you know, a, an archeological demonstration of where knowledge is at. It's more so utilizing representation and, and, and being inclusive so that people have a venue to be able to show this is our history, this is our story, this is our anchoring but use it as a dynamic process to engage further in the communication. Most museums now, and, and again, we know the history of museums that they were, they were limited, you know, they weren't inclusive and it was, uh, there was appropriations that had taken place and, and misuse, misrepresentation of knowledge, et cetera, et cetera. So there's been some significant changes, a hermeneutic shift geared more towards the idea of, of interpretation and utilizing artifact, utilizing representation of behavior as an incitement to, to dialogue about how does this impact individuals? How does this, how do people contribute to that discussion? How, where's, where's their take on it, right? You know, it works best when it's a question rather than an answer. And so, you know, when we look at installation and, and look at a, a recipe book, you know, a recipe book the best recipe book has the folded, the folded dog ear and it has a little bit of note in there. It says, in my house, we modified this one. It's, it's, not, a, it's not a, it's a suggestion, but, the, but it doesn't require a, a complete adherence to or, or blind obligation to the author. It's, it's an invitation to, to play around and to negotiate and to navigate things and such. So I think when we speak about food tradition, um, and, and, and cooking is that process. We want to recognize it as that dynamic communication that reflects culture and we reflect different kinds of economic and other social cultural practices that have had an impact on our historic communities. And I want to continue on this thread of, of um, engaging with communities and allowing the archive to sort of be a public engagement. Um, and proliferating through people's participation. I wanna hear about more on your work organizing the digital Matanza um, and maybe you could give us a primer on Matanzas in general, the tradition. But uh, I want to know sort of um, where that project is stemming from with the Manitos Community Memory Project and why is it important to um, continue participating in this community ritual and, and codifying it in or translating it to a digital archive. Okay, okay, and and so again, this is a project the the the, the Manitos Digital Archive and, and spearheaded by Esteban Rael y Galvez. You, I'm, I'm sure everybody's familiar with it. He's, he has a, a tremendous repertoire of work, you know, cultural and historical work in New Mexico. So the digital archive is framed as is precisely that what I mentioned earlier an invitation for dialogue for people to include their stories and create this, this larger sharing mechanism of story, whether it be grandma's story, whether it be something, you know, from a, an academician or such, giving, allowing for that venue. So people could contribute their own stories and recognize, you know, where their placement is within a larger discussion. Uh, I got invited to be part of it because of my dissertation work. I come out of a background of cultural linguistic anthropology my dissertation was directed at you know story and the narrative formation of querencia and place identity and, and not to go extend into that so i've been working with this idea of story and place for a long time now and so we're, we're creating digital space for that to take place we're all familiar with with that that beautiful context and that beautiful social social situation when people sit down and they feel comfortable of sharing their ideas. In fact, much of human social existence is storytelling. We're all, we all engage in storytelling, whether it be text written or, or, or the story around the kitchen table or, or just even, you know, the majority of our communication, our, our personal anecdote and story and such. Um, so there's structures to those stories, et cetera, et cetera. And to the degree that we recognize where those stories are and, and support them and facilitate for them to take place, that lends a, a lot in the sense of not only cultural sharing, 
but community building, this idea that culture and community and, and communication are all articulated and tied in together. They're one in the same entity. Uh, the digital archives is, is, is uh, an attempt to bring it to a larger audience who doesn't have the, the privilege or doesn't have the opportunity to meet with, uh, with any kind of frequency of saying the Sunday afternoon discussion in the city park or, or just running across a neighbor, uh, across the fence, et cetera. The digital ar archive, Manito digital archives process or project is designed to allow for that kind of larger exchange using, using uh, digital materials or dig digital exchange networks, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the Matanza component to it is, let, let me share that we've been um, here at Highlands for about 12, 13 years. Our Mecha student organization as a community giveaway, we've been working with a Matanza everybody familiar, a slaughtering, a sharing mechanism. And with our Mecha student organization, it was framed as a community giveaway, uh, a repartimento, a distribution to community members that have contributed to different projects that the, the Mecha student organization was involved in. So we got started with that maybe, maybe as much as 15 years ago. And we were doing a traditional hog matanza. We, would, we were doing our own, um, slaughter and butcher, you know, do our own harvest of the animal. And we would take it off campus and do it in a traditional manner that's been in place for, for quite some time here in New Mexico. And of course, it's representative of a much larger history. So we started to do them here at the university at large. And so what we frame as a university matanza is a little bit different in, in the sense that it's not traditional because we're not doing the dispatch. Uh, we're not doing the the butchering, those have to be, you know, for public health, uh, EPA criteria, you know, uh, again, you need a registered slaughterhouse and a butcher to do that work. So, so we have that done for us. But at the university, we actually even built a facility that we're calling our cultural park, where we allowed, where we're, we were able to sponsor this event. So we did one three, we did them 14, 15 years ago and reinvented them came back to doing them three years ago. And, and then we did one just now in October mm -hmm. and we fed maybe around 700 people. And we have a, a, a permanent pit where we pit cooked a steer and two pigs and did 600 pounds of chicharron wow. and did a whole, yeah, we, so it was a big operation, but the digital, the digital Marta, Matanza aspect of it is kind of to demonstrate some of the imagery around again not not so much the cooking procedure because again that you have to be there and 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 as as andy had mentioned that sensory issue you know you 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 can't write about smell in a book you can make reference to it but there's a phenomenology there in place you know you you, you can make reference to how food tastes but you really can't describe it that adequately in a recipe book so same thing, we're, we're, we're saying this is how we do things. This is the, the social event and this is the cultural sharing that goes on. But please recognize it as an invitation to experiment and to explore and to look at how um, your, your story, your family's recipe, your family's practice ties into it. So, so that's kind of the idea that we're utilizing this facility and it's framed as a public space so that different entities could come in. We have an orno, a uh, bread or orno that's in place. We're gonna have some grills in place, but really the big attraction is that pit. Uh, it, it was a significant uh, design on the part of our president that committed to working with that. So we frame it as a community event and hopefully sponsor more different kinds of levels of community eventing as well. Amazing, um, it sounds, it's it matanzas are so fun <laughs> there it's such a um and and i agree with you there's so much of the memory of um of the smells and the and the tastes is um is what solidifies it in your in a person's memory as something that is an incredible meaningful experience um and and those sensory memories then connect you back to the heritage of of the tradition, which is um, 
which is so great. It's it's meaningful. Um, oh, that, that, if I may, that, that kind of shows up as a question for us is how do we archive? Mm -hmm. How do we demonstrate? So that for people that are not familiar, it works for people that are familiar and say, yeah, I know what chicharrones this are. And, you know, I, I know fry bread and this and that. And so there's an anchor within with which to compare and remind them. But for those that don't understand, you know, where those sen sensory applications are or where that is, you know, how, how do we frame our sharing mechanisms that you could actually access and, and, and sponsor that sort of appreciation? And, and that's where the, the technology comes into it and the media. Um, and I, and I'd like to throw in a yeah. comment too there, um, you know, also deciding what doesn't get shared. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that uh, for myself personally, in dealing with cultural mature material, whether it's from my own, you know, Latino cultural experience or whether it's indigenous communities that we're engaging with is, you know, it's just as important to decide you know, what we share, but also what we don't share. And, um, you know, that's something that's come out of some recent projects that we've worked on that has really solidified in my mind in terms of uh, our responsibilities to, you know, not only um, collecting and presenting the history, but also framing it. Yeah, that's an excellent point. And with this, with the ability of technology or media to, uh, give us lots of information all at once. You really have to be discerning. And I did wanna ask you, Andy, since you're sort of running on a parallel thread with um, leveraging media, such as with your podcast, um, to augment public knowledge of indigenous culture and traditions uh, with food as the entry point, how do you see media and media narratives um, helping or limiting the possibilities for the future of indigenous foodways? Um, you know, the, for in, okay, so food media has really changed a lot um, in the last decade or so. Um, there are so many different um, uh, media publications uh, and smaller publications, local publications, uh, publications just dedicated to a specific type of food and a specific culture and regions. Um, there's, there's my food media here, which is only uh, highlighting indigenous food. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, this is a really great time for um, you know, I think the way food is going now, now that we're learning a lot more about where our food comes from, we are starting to see these uh, large systems of food as uh, problematic. And we're starting to uh, think about and move towards uh, different, more sustainable, smaller and local food systems. Uh, I mean, you know, it's only, it's only, um, in this evolutionary process right now uh, because of all the different coverage that we have of food, because of even like the entertainment, uh, you know, kind of um, food programs you have on Food Network, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the kind of work that folks like Anthony Bourdain have done uh, in the last, you know, couple decades has really opened up everybody's mind to the power of food and to the um, um, how maybe fragile, you know, some of these food systems are, especially when it comes to smaller uh, cultural um, food systems that have, you know, a little bit more meaning to people. Um, you know, so I think right now the media is really doing a very, very good job bringing out all these stories because, you know, it's, um, you know, <laughs> the more we know, the, the more uh, we can do something about it and have solutions and share ideas. I mean, I don't, I don't see how we can, or I don't see how, you know, we've kind of done like this sort of, you know, motion with, uh, food coverage, it's only just been going like 
<laughs> up more and more food uh, stories and and issues coming to light, you know, um, since I've been focusing on food for the last like, you know, eight years or so. So I think uh, food media has just been very, very positive, especially in native food. Um, it's really the last very few years that native food is really getting the, the spotlight and the ink that it deserves. You know, for so long, people had no idea that uh, Native Americans were still around. <laughs> and uh, I think right now we're starting to understand what Native American food is about and um, all the different um, issues like um, environment, like um, access to land, uh, political issues, um, sovereignty issues, uh, economic issues, all of these issues. I think people are starting to now understand it. And that's just because of the food media and the work that native journalists like myself um, do uh, to push these stories out there. So um, yeah, there, there's there's a, a, lot, a lot of information out there now you mm-hmm. can learn about native food and um, the beauty of it and what, what threatens it. And I think, and the other thing that is uh, interesting to me relating what you just said to Josie's comment, um, the fact that people have um, now a lot more uh, agency over what they share and, and um, obviously there's still progress to be made. We're not, we're not totally at the um, universal accessibility level yet, but there has been lots of access made to publish like self-publishing podcast or having a website, having, um, having blogs. And that amount of agency also allows people to sort of, um, to sort of maintain like privacy around things that like parts of traditions that, that they don't want to be shared. Um, and sort of, it allows people to shape to, to shape the media narrative um, when, when they have the agency and the sovereignty over, over the stories that they, that they tell and that they want to be out into the world, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. which I think is nice. Um, and, and Josie, I wanna, um, since we've been talking about these, these methods in, in creating archives, and this maybe goes back to what you were saying um, in your first response, but I do wanna dig a little bit more into um, your work as a curator, engaging with archives and then uh, interpreting them for public facing ends. Um, and how does food provide historic, provide context to historical research? Um, and how does it sort of fold into a museum context? Yeah, um, can I share my screen? Yes, I believe you have um, the option. Great, um, let's see if I can do this without getting too confused here. Um, Okay, so, um, you know, obviously as a museum that has collections of art and history, um, you know, we have a ton of like manos y matates. We have our history curator recently collected, I think a pressure cooker from like the 50s or 60s. <laughs> I mean, we have like, I can't even tell you, you know, the stuff that we have that tells the stories of cooking and it, and it cuts across all kinds of communities and cultures. Um, but one of the things that our museum is really grappling with right now is how do we utilize both our collections and our exhibitions to kind of push against the idea of the tricultural myth, which has been present in New Mexican history for, I don't know, ever, right? I think probably um, that's something that this group could talk on for probably days. But so how do we utilize those collections to also create projects that we're, we're, we're pushing about and thinking in different ways? So one of the ways that we found that's been productive is through some of our exhibitions and projects. So the image that you're seeing here is actually a project that we did with the Sea Broadcast Project, which is part of the Art and Ecology Department at UNM. And they are a collective that basically went across New Mexico and collected seed stories. So each one of these glass gourds that you see here contains 
uh, seeds from a specific farmer. And then the earth on the rammed earth structure is the earth from that farm. And then from above, you actually hear an audio, a story of that farmer talking about those seeds and what they grew and what they cooked and how they cultivated it. And honestly, this was one of the projects that allowed for us to acknowledge the complex and complicated histories that exist between the three cultures that supposedly, you know, have lived in New Mexico peacefully alongside of each other for centuries. Um, to acknowledge that challenging and difficult history, but at the same time, to understand that farming is something that cuts across all of our communities. It created an opportunity for us to connect and engage in different ways. And so some of the triptychs in the background, you'll see there's like the, uh, the Tiwa Women United uh, participated in this exhibition. The programming that went around this also was fascinating because we had um, a really beautiful memorial to one of the Diné farmers that were also part of this that um, who passed away um, earlier than, than when the ex exhibition came up. And so his grandson talked about what it was like to learn about farming from a Diné perspective. And so it was a fascinating project, but what it, what it taught us is that what we collect and how we collect matters. Because at the end of the day, how are we going to create projects like this that acknowledge history, that acknowledge the challenges that exist within our communities and the way that we've struggled alongside each other and against each other, but also what are the intersections that, that food and farming create opportunities to find places where we can celebrate the beauty of those communities. And, and I also love the way that it cut across time because not only did they explore traditional farming methods, but they were looking at how different farmers were using both traditional and contemporary farming methods um, throughout New Mexico. And so um, it was just a fascinating project, but it really, I wanted to, to show it to you because it really shaped, you know, the way that that I think about our collections and our and our exhibitions also as archives, right? We often think that it's just the objects we collect, but it's the projects that we realize. It's the collaborations that we build and create with community. And so for me, um, that's also part of our museum's archive is the programming and the exhibitions that bring together um, communities. And then this image here, um, is a mural, a word uh, mural that was done by Ruben Olguin. And these are plant-based, um, uh, uh, the, the material that you see on the wall are earth-based um, materials that Ruben collected all over New Mexico mm -hmm. and then used them to paint this mural. And he told the story about how very, very precious and rare this particular gold earth is to find. And he decided to use the word resilience um, as the way that he wanted to use that pigment in his mural. And, and when he spoke, he talked about food as resilience. And I think that was another aspect of what I learned um, from the artists, from this project and from the stories, um, you know, going back to this idea of stories um, and collecting them and the importance of that. But, it, but this really brought home for me um, the import of how the intersections, not only of, of culture um, and history, but food really matter. Wow. Um, Could I comment on that idea of resilience? I, I, I really do appreciate that, Doctora. And, and more so because again, you know, I, I, I think part of our larger conversation is, 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 is very much that, that discussion or that dance between what, what is traditional food food culture as opposed to innovation and creative and, and navigational kind of projects? And I think for, for many of us in New Mexico and in Southern Colorado, I, I always include, uh, the food is identity as well. And, and, and particularly the food that's directly coming out of our landscapes that we either personally or we're familiar with who work that land to be able to bring it to our tables and such. And I think that's one of the areas where, where New Mexico food tradition is particularly rich because there's a direct relationship to the fields and the landscapes and the, and the hills where we hunted and gathered and grew this food ourselves. 
and so there, there, there's a special flavor to it because if it came from your own handiwork, you know, the, it does have a different kind of meaning set. And so consequently, historically, the adherence to and that, um, that, that self-respect of adhering to traditional cooking technologies and conditional foodstuffs is a contradiction to modernization and postmodernist types of practices that are coming into place. And so consequently, there, that's where part of the history is. Uh, I, I agree with Dr. Lopez in the sense that when we look at foodstuffs, particularly the, the, the development of foodstuffs that come with the different waves of colonization, in New Mexico, we've had two significant agricultural revolutions. One is when we moved from hunter-gatherer society and moved to three sisters agriculture by means of articulation with Mesoamerican indigenous groups and, and that networking process that came in place. And of course, with the Spanish colonization process, it, the, the introduction of so many different types of technologies and foodstuffs and, and fruits and et cetera, et cetera, changed around and lent for a new creative process and a balance because again, colonization is very aggressive. It's, it's bellicose, it's, it, it could be very nasty at times. But afterwards, when you achieve those balances of what does that mean and how do we start truly incorporating and building community and, cre and, and, and mixing these, these different kinds of cultural traditions, I think that's very much reflected in our contemporary food traditions because we have that, we have those balances reached. Again, we, as an example, within Native American cuisine and fare, you have mutton and fry bread. And again, those, those are European introductions that take on a particular meeting within indigenous communities and such. And so we have a lot of those, those, those stories and those, those intersections of where well, well, a foodstuff came from one area, was introduced but then it becomes real create a creative outlet. And for me, you know, the, the, to go into some of the restaurants in Santa Fe or Albuquerque and such, and there's a name for something. When Taco Bell came out with the Enchirito, I was appalled at first and saying, there is no such a thing, you know? But then I recognize that's, that's the creative process mm -hmm. that cuisine is about. Cu cuisine is a culture, it's a communication, it's a dance, it's, it's, it's a creativity. And even though it tastes better if you understand the, the, the deeper historical meaning of how these foodstuffs came about and how they were part of our, our landscape and our culture, it still gives us potential and possibility to play with new areas, but also to recognize for some people, there's an adherence to a particular way of doing things because it is a cultural resistance in and of itself. Yeah, and the importance of maintaining um, that strict adherence to a ritual or a rule or um, uh, using using the rules as guideposts to maintain to make sure that the culture um, maintains itself and so that it doesn't just like blend into um, blend into anything into its own disappearance and I um, this this notion of, of food as resilience um, I know that Andy, that also is sort of um, a through line in the in the podcast, and I um, I just want to know sort of um, your thoughts on resilience, resistance, and um, and and this notion of of all the different ways that indigenous food is remixed through throughout history, throughout time, and families. Yeah. Um... You know, just the fact that uh, Native food is still here, I mean, that says a lot about resistance and there's a lot of work happening at, um, you know, a lot of different levels to uh, reclaim different um, uh, ingredients and seeds and, um, you know, you know, sometimes bring back uh, traditional ways of doing a couple of things. And, um, you know, I like, I, I think somebody, uh, you know, kind of alluded to different um, 
a ceremony and you know there's a place for these foods um very specifically i mean that is um something you know that that uh you know, food and ceremony and um, different parts of our lives and how we choose to acknowledge like special events, you know, go hand in hand with food. I mean, holidays, you know, <laughs> yeah, contemporary holidays is like all about food. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I think, um, you know, it's, it's, a uh, there's, there's a lot of, um, yeah, there's a lot of sharing that happens uh, today in Native American uh, food culture. And that's something that I really enjoy seeing. I mean, sure, you have some people who are very strict with um, the traditional way of doing things and eating and, um, you know, teaching their children how to, uh, you know, make a specific kind of uh, traditional whatever tribe, you know, that's from whatever land you're from, that dish, you know, how to make it, when to make it, um, how to gather, you know, that, that kind of knowledge that's passed around. But it's really exciting to see how different um, tribes are uh, swapping food in ingredients and flavors. Uh, it, it's, it, it's really exciting to see the chefs who are working uh, this kind of like inner tribal um fair this inner tribal uh culinary um you know party that's going on i mean because that's that's traditionally how it's been right we've always uh we've always swapped ingredients and um you know traveled along all of these trade routes right now our trade routes are social media and uh, online shops where i can have access to um you know salmon and wild rice and um you know syrup uh, maple syrup from the tribes up north and around the coasts so um you know, that, <laughs> that's, um, you know, something that's not in, in the past. I know a lot of people like to talk about Native Americans in the past, but, um, you know, my work and my podcast is all about telling our stories right now. Um, you know, we're still in this traditional state of sharing knowledge, even if it's, you know, all across different tribes and, you know, we have a wider, um, you know, much, much wider trade routes right now. So, um, yeah, our, our, our food culture is very much, very much still active, <laughs> very much active right now. And um, I think we're seeing a lot of, um, uh, you know, of course, media uh, paying attention to that. And I really like that, uh, um, the sentiment of like the tradition, the mainstay tradition of all cultures really is knowledge sharing and circulation and that um, will forever exist. That's sort of um, humanity wide and it, and it, when it's not being used in an oppressive way, it's, it creates these beautiful um, proliferations and progress of humanity. And, um, and, and I really like the framing of knowledge sharing uh, being a tradition that exists through things like social media, through things like um, the being able to, like the technologies that afford us like refrigeration, being able to, um, to trade across continents um, and across oceans because, of, um, because you can preserve um, ingredients and food. Um, yeah, I like that framework. <laughs> I, I think yeah. it's important. And Andy brought up the point of uh, where food tradition could be tied in with ceremony and in and, and spiritual understandings as well. And I think uh, we, we all recognize that within our, 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 our food traditions, there's a direct articulation with, with, with nutrition and wellness and wellness, both in a physical and a spiritual sense as well. And for that matter, again, you know, with the, with that place based, that land based orientation of recognizing where foodstuffs come on, come from, we're we're very strong with understanding where where our medicinals are as well, because medic medicine and food are are not are inseparable for one another. And and for many of us, that takes us way back to hunter gather tradition. You know, we 
I know where the Osha fields are. I, I know where the, the, the Garambuyo, the elderberry are at. And, and part of the landscape that I was brought up with, again, that was the proper part of the wisdom is place is knowing where to hunt, where to gather and where to, to well, I'll leave it with that. Where, where, where could we gather in a sustainable manner? And, and I'm afraid that, again, that ongoing discussion of saying, you know, there's, there's a sacredness and there's a, a propriety that goes along with some of that knowledge that all of it doesn't need to necessarily be shared because it could be mis misunderstood, mis misrepresented, or, mis or, or appropriated. Uh, the areas in Southern Colorado that I'm, that I'm from, uh, we, we know of a company in particular that came up and harvested all the Osha root and left a barren a landscape where historically our, our families have been up there and that we, we knew how to manage those, those medicinal areas um, because there was a respect. And I think again, you know, to the degree that we share our, our knowledge, our wisdom, as it relates to food production, food, uh, food transfer and, and food productivity, ties in with that larger issue of, of, of sovereignty. And within the sovereignty discussion, there's a, a land-based discussion is placed uh, again, I mentioned the the the, travel, the the tragedy that we're dealing with up here with with a significant loss of Sierra. Um, how how is that going to impact many of our people that had relied on those those mountains and hills and valleys for foodstuffs as well? And what's going to replace it? And, and and coming back to looking at reconstruction models, does is it going to allow people to go up there to? to be able to access that land. And that becomes the, the bigger issue, a uh, historical political issue because our traditions, our food traditions are based on access to landscapes. And we know historically that those were appropriated by different, different forms of colonizing governance that came in and it extracted people from their landscapes and extracted them from their own food sovereignty uh, uh, protocols. Yeah, I'd love to pick up on that idea for okay. food sovereignty also. Um, and I have a couple of images again, if that's okay. Or if Andy, if you want to go first, I can go after you. Oh, well, I wanted to uh, just uh, uh, have a quick comment about, um, you know, there's also, uh, you can talk about discrimination, of course, when talking about food too, because you, you mentioned appropriation that happens. I mean, sage right now, right, is like hot. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody wants to have sage for some reason. Um, and, uh, you know, th there's similar stories like that, where there's uh, this company that came in and took everything or, um, you know, a restaurant restaurant or two popped up and uh, owned by a non-native uh, person um, who just used those recipes and got famous off of uh, recipes that they quite literally stole from, you know, little old ladies in Mexico, um, you know, <laughs> and, yeah. and it's that kind of like uh, discrimination, um, you know, of, of wealth. Uh, a lot of people of color don't have that kind of um, wealth to just start a business and, and, you know, make a living off of their own food and their own uh, family food knowledge. It's um, something that I've talked about uh, a lot in my podcast too, with, um, you know, lots of different chefs. And, and then, uh, you know, another thing you mentioned, you know, the Montanza, you had to go butcher somewhere else, or, you know, there's a lot of that kind of po policy um, that uh, keeps our food from being uh, shared or used how we want to use it. A lot of uh, traditional native foods can't be sold uh, because of, you know, food policy and safety policy. Um, a lot of uh, different game animals can't be uh, sold or shared in like restaurants or anything like that because of these policies. So, you know, these, these, some of these traditions just have to live very small in our families and in our little spaces instead of, you know, um, you know, being shared at a, at a more wide scale, but 
you know, there's a, that, that's kind of like a double-edged sword. Do you want to share it with everybody or, you know, do you want to keep it, you know, um, you know, in this intimate setting in your, in your own community? Yeah, absolutely. And Josie, did you want to follow Yeah, up? I was just going to share one other um, project that actually I think might tie um, some of these ideas um, together. Um, and it was, this was basically a project that I did um, at 516 Arts and it was called um, Puerto Rico Defying Darkness. And so in this particular exhibition, you know, there were so many different artists that were reeling because it was in the aftermath of um, Hurricane Maria. And so in the same way that, you know, we're talking about here, Eric is talking about um, you know, the devastation, what does it mean to have land loss? What does it mean to be in a situation where you're grappling with, you know, historical um, homelands being devastated? And so there were so many different artists that interestingly brought in food as a way to talk about that and how in many places, even though you live on this incredible tropical island, it's a, it's a food desert because there isn't sovereignty, there isn't this opportunity to grow traditional foods in the way that it had done in the past. And again, bringing back in those layers of colonization, by the time Puerto Rico gets to the point where US imperialism kind of um, encapsulates what's happening there economically, politically, culturally, you end up losing some of those opportunities. So there's this struggle, there's this fight to, to keep that food sovereignty, you know, on the island. And in this particular work, you see that these vases, which are like the Rome, the sort of objectified bodies, uh, Caribbean bodies that are inhabited by the tropical fruits and of, of the island, you know, here again, it becomes like the sale, the commodification of culture and foods and traditions. And so artists have a very particular way of bringing all of that together to make a pretty intense political statement, you know, about what's happening. Um, there was another work that was by Patrick McGrath Muniz, which was also, you know, in the in the show. And you can see here in the upper right hand oh. a part of the image, it's like a reference <laughs> to Starbucks, right? And the commercialization of what has happened to our communities, our traditional communities over time as, as the environment is devastated, as our traditional ways get devastated. You know, and this has a crazy amount of references to, you know, the current moment and things like, you know, Francisco Goya with the dog looking up at the boat in the bottom right-hand corner. So there's this kind of, the arts, the visual arts allow for this reflection, this contemplation, this, unmasking of you know what is happening politically and environmentally that impact our communities that have over time had to deal with these layers of you know of colonization that that have that have happened um this is a stunning painting and i and i appreciate this uh understanding too of of um the importance of art history art historical knowledge and um and the the way that artists um, can make political statements through individual expressions um, and by reaching back to other traditions, um, it all it it interweaves um, in a really beautiful way, and again brings it back to this question of like how do we understand an archive and does it have to be something that's documented in books and um, and and put away in, in institutions that can or cannot deny, you know, they decide whether they provide access to people for, for research and, and knowledge sharing. And so it's, um, um, it's, it's just interesting to think about this, this, who is producing the knowledge, who is circulating the knowledge, what gets protected, what doesn't, um, it all overlaps in interesting ways. Um, my final question for today is like very macro, big picture. Um, so that's like a warning <laughs> um, that uh, I wanted to ask this final question of like, how does cooking or food ritual or food sharing storytelling, um, how does that create social cohesion? 
And that's for all three of you, of course. <laughs> Well, you know, it brought all of us together right now. <laughs> um, Good you know, point. Food, <laughs> you know, I, I know it's kind of cliche, but yeah, food brings everybody together. And, um, you know, the, there's nothing that, uh, um, uh, I don't know, you know, that, that's, um, being, a, being a food journalist, I mean, just, there's no shortage of stories. There's no shortage of, um, you know, issues that pop up and uh, stories of people making changes because, you know, food is, of course, we need it to live every single day and it gives certain people power. It, um, um, you know, means that certain people don't have power. It, it, uh, it is something that we should be paying a lot more attention to, I think. Um, and uh, I think these days there's, just like I said a while ago, you know, a lot of a lot more people are paying a little bit more attention and there's a lot more work happening to change all these different systems. And, um, you know, kind of on this smaller scale in Native America, um, you know, it's brought so many uh, different chefs together and farmers together. We're all swapping uh, different uh, ideas about um, food preservation and traditions and, um, you know, storytelling and, you know, different sciences, you know, that, that, that can be found in, um, in food, in the culinary arts. Um, it's just, it's always going to be something that's going to bring us together, whether, you know, to talk about an issue or to celebrate or to learn from one another or just to, you know, get to know a, a new person, you know, this is, it's the ultimate like social um, glue, yeah. <laughs> that cohesion. <laughs> I think I, you know, I absolutely agree with Andy that food is one of the ways that, and farming is one of the ways that communities can come together in, in multiple ways. But I've been thinking about this a lot lately that there's a lot of work that has to be done within our own communities, whether you're talking about Latino communities or indigenous communities or whatever that, you know, there have for a long time been these divisions about what is identity and who gets to own it and who gets to define it and who gets to share it. And I think that by working through some of that within our communities, then that gives us some of the space and some of the tools that we'll need to start doing some of the healing across communities. And, uh, you know, I feel like that's something that's been on my mind a lot lately. Um, as my own, you know, Latino community is grappling with all kinds of, of issues that, that people fall on different sides of. Um, and so, again, being specific about what community even means, I guess, is another, you know, important aspect of that. So, um, for me, I love this idea that there is a great equalizer out there. We all have to eat. We all have to figure out where to get food to sustain ourselves. Um, and, you know, how can we use that as a tool to do some of this work that still, you know, still needs to be done. Besides sex, I can't think of a more base <laughs> endeavor that we have to be involved in for, you know, for 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 comforts and pleasures and 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 subsistence and survivability, but we don't get to talk about sex in an open space. <laughs> food we can that's a public forum that's automatic it's a private enterprise that we get to make public because it is so common amongst us all um i if i didn't mention it, my my academic background is social uh cultural linguistic anthropology and i've got i've had the opportunity to work in a lot of different uh communities and such and so for me there's a big list of things that i've ate amphibians, reptiles, insects, I've ate dog before, et cetera, et cetera. And it's really interesting that I use it as an exercise for inclusion. In, in some of the courses that I, that, I, that I work with, 
when we want to talk about inclusive practices and in and, and developing that cultural relativity of, 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 of recognizing that people have different palates and we eat different kind of foodstuffs, it, it, it's again, it's that equalizer that Dr. Lopez talks about. It's a commonality that we all share and we could use it on a lot of different kinds of levels of discussion. And for me, the bringing in that inclusive discussion down, well, how many of you eat hot dogs and bologna and tell them, do you know what goes into that? <laughs> you know, when, when they say, oh, you ate an iguana and they, they make a frown and a face and they say, yeah, but you eat hot dogs and, and that has everything in there, you know, so, so <laughs> let's be a little bit more respective or cognizant again of, of, of food culture from different kinds of traditions such. But again, it's a common communication because it is such a base human function of us to eat and for us to be able to bring that private sharing into a public. As long as it's respectful, though, I, I, I got to anchor that discussion, you know, because sometimes we're not re, uh, respectful because they think there's a certain way of, of preparing the foodstuffs and there's an authority and, and uh, an arrogance that goes along with it. So as long as that particular discussion is, is respectful and, and culturally uh, inclusive, then it makes for good discussion, say, and, and think about that is, is, is that opportunity for, for communication saying, we do things this way, how do you do things? Um, it's, it's, it's almost a, an initial kind of, of, of greeting here in New Mexico, is you ask a person, well, where are you from? And you could ask that question as well. Well, what did you eat today? It's, <laughs> it's a common denominator. It's a coagulating factor. And so therefore, that's why it's so common. I, I, I don't take pictures of my plates when I'm eating them, but I know that's a common practice. And, and you know, it's, it's a means of communication. It's, that's just how common it is. So of course, there's a social cohesion. But as long as, again, there, it, it, it's framed in a respectful and accepting inquiry-based manner. Yeah, and if I could add, um, you know, tasting around and eating at different restaurants, especially today, is one of the easiest ways to learn about um, other people, to learn about, um, you know, different uh, flavors and uh, textures and ingredients that come from all over the world that that, that come from a specific uh, group of people. I mean, you know, that was that's one of the first things I learned learned about food and one of the first things that really hooked me um, when it came to food is the just how how different everybody sees one one ingredient like a potato or a chili I mean god like it, it's it's so different and and um, you know in, in places like Albuquerque and um, you know anywhere you can have all kinds of different food Indian food and Korean food and uh, Middle Eastern food. I mean, if I would, I would really, you know, tell, tell the audience to go and broaden your palate and taste all of these different kinds of food. It just might make you curious enough to really learn about that uh, community and then learn about the issues. And, you know, pretty soon you'll just be like obsessed with the world. <laughs> and all of that can happen just by tasting food and being curious about it and and having an open mind about it. I mean, I always to tell people like you're going to eat every day until you die. You can afford to go, you know, try something different. <laughs> you know, don't just stick to macaroni and cheese and spaghettios. You know, you can <laughs> you're, you're going to get a lot more out of uh, tasting around your local restaurants than, you know, macaroni and cheese and spaghettios. <laughs> And, and of course, the strategy with that is always eat first and ask afterwards what it is. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. And even if it's something that, uh, you know, you have questions about, just put salsa on it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, a dead snake, a uh, 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 rubber tire would taste good in a taco. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, would have a would have a certain texture for sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>
Cook it for 14 hours. Everything's good after 14 hours. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love I love that as an ending point because I think that that's such a um a fantastic conclusion. Um and I agree. Um and thank you thank you Josie, Eric, Andy. Um you're so generous with your insight today. Um and I so appreciate it. And I also of course want to thank uh Three Sisters Kitchen um and my collaborators Divana and Isha uh who have been working with me tirelessly to put this together. Um, so I, I truly appreciate it. And um, links to resources um, and further information will be available in the YouTube description. Um, so you can uh, broaden your horizons through, through reading, um, but go eat some tasty food. <laughs> Thanks everyone.